2009 was a really unique year for gaming. The next generation of consoles were in full swing, online games were becoming massively popular, indie games were starting to be able to stand on their own, and as a whole the gaming industry was really starting to pivot from physical media to digitalized copies of games. And while we've looked at 2007 and 2008 so far, 2009 really served as a major turning point in the gaming industry and was possibly one of the best years of all time for video games as a whole. So once again, I'm here with Luke and today we're taking a look back at 2009 and why 2009 truly was the best year for gaming. Let's get into it. First off, just riding on the high from 2007, Call of Duty as a whole was one of the biggest franchises that gaming had ever seen. Call of Duty 4 was a massive hit, and World at War proved that the concept shown in Call of Duty 4 could work in later installments, even on a yearly basis. In 2009, we actually saw releases of World at War DLC packs released on a regular basis, with new zombie maps included in each map pack which was kind of a new thing at its time, but it set the standard for the Call of Duty franchise, specifically Treyarch, in releasing zombie maps later on in future installments. And while Zombies was really popular, none of that really compared to the hype that surrounded the release of Modern Warfare 2, possibly the most anticipated game of the entire year, and honestly, rightfully so. This game took everything that was good in Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare and just expanded on it infinitely, adding new kill streaks, new weapons, refined gameplay, and some of the best maps we've ever seen in a Call of Duty game. The competitive scene was crazy, the voice chat in Modern Warfare 2 was interesting, and of course we can't forget the fact that the single player was extremely unique in just how they took storytelling and kind of developed the early stages of World War 3 in a video game and in a way that was actually believable. Oh, and Spec Ops was pretty fun too. 2009 also saw the release of Assassin's Creed 2, which kind of started that major momentum behind the Assassin's Creed franchise as a whole. Sure, a lot of people did like the first Assassin's Creed game, but it just felt as a whole there was a ton of new people being introduced to Assassin's Assassin's Creed with the introduction of Assassin's Creed 2, along with players who had been around since the first game who were excited to see where this story would go. The refined gameplay used in Assassin's Creed 2 definitely helped a lot, and it definitely solidified this as an ongoing franchise in the gaming community. Bayonetta also released in 2009, which served as this really unique hack and slash action adventure game that ended up starting its own legacy in its own right, and while it released on the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, its publishing history and where the future installments of this game went after this initial release is kind of crazy to think about, but it all started way back in 2009 and this is still a solid game to this day. We also saw expansions to Grand Theft Auto 4 with The Ballad of Gay Tony and The Lost in the Damned, which was really cool just because it re-sparked interest in the Grand Theft Auto series. Even though Grand Theft Auto 4 was still widely popular, this added a new story mode to kind of play through, but it also re-sparked interest in the online side of the game, which added a ton of new features, and it was really fun to play back then. We also saw the release of Skate 2, which added a ton of features from the existing first Skate game, and really kind of ended up being the staple Skate game as a whole. Skate 2 definitely was the best Skate game in the three that released, and it was just so well balanced and refined with how precise you could could control your skater and just the world building they had made and the art style used made Skate 2 such a popular game. First of all, let me get two games out of the way that we already made in-depth reviews on just a few months ago and that also came out in 2009 and that being Borderlands 1 and Left 4 Dead 2. And both games were game of the year contender for many people and rightfully so. If you want to know how these games hold up today and why they were so good back in the day, check out our years later reviews on them. So let's get back to some games we haven't talked as much about yet on 
on this channel. In 2009, Batman Arkham Asylum came out. And this was the first, like, really, really good superhero video game. There were some okay superhero games before, but nothing like this. This one told its own story that you haven't seen in a movie yet, which immediately made it feel fresh, since it also had fleshed out characters and good dialogue and good writing. I feel like not as many people knew back then what Arkham Asylum was, really, and what part it played in the Batman universe, so this game really showed it off well. Gameplay also was really, really good. Like, it didn't feel too challenging, but if you mastered the controls, it was also rewarding at the same time. And I feel like this game kept itself fresh with first of all having an overworld that was really fun to explore, and also having like different gameplay sections where you had a stealth section where you gotta use some gadgets, and then you had a fight section where you just gotta fight and punch some dudes. While personally Arkham City is probably my favorite game in the franchise, I gotta say this one is a close second. Dragon Age Origins also released in 2009, and if you have seen any of our Mass Effect videos, you'll know that we like old school Bioware. This game is just really well liked with RPG fans across the board, even in 2019. This game introduced some interesting gameplay mechanics and dialogue options, and this game is actually planned for one of our years later reviews after we finish the Mass Effect series. So make sure you check back for that if you want to know how Dragon Age Origins holds up in 2019. Now let's actually go on to one game that split the community back in the day, Resident Evil 5. I remember completely hating this game when it came out, because the setting was so much different after I played Resident Evil 4 and it didn't feel scary at all. And obviously it was hard to come in after Resident Evil 4 and make a better game or equal game when Resident Evil 4 was so well received. And I think that's how a lot of the community felt back in the day. And now 10 years later my opinion completely changed on the game. I actually don't think it's a bad Resident Evil game at all anymore and it's pretty fun. Maybe it was helped by Resident Evil 6 being such a weird mess? Resident Evil 5 actually tells an interesting story and has some interesting characters. And the gameplay is what you would expect from a Resident Evil game, honestly. Also this was the first mainline Resident Evil game that introduced two-player co-op. Where you could play online with a friend on 360 and PS3, not so much on PC because I think the game was games for Windows Live which probably didn't work. But now it's out on Steam so you have a better option to play it on PC. Nonetheless, I feel like this game really split the Resident Evil community and the opinions were so mixed, at least from what I've heard. Now going from one game that I changed my opinion to a positive one over the years, going to one that probably doesn't hold up as well anymore. Fear 2 Project Origin. I really loved the Fear Trilogy back in the day and I even played the free-to-play multiplayer Quake clone that they put out. And I'm not talking about Fear Online, there was a different one. I think it was called Fear Combat and it might have been the Fear 1 multiplayer as like a standalone free-to-play thing, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. 2009 Fear 2 Origins came out and I really loved the game, but now looking back on it, I gotta say some of the gameplay feels really clunky and the level design is really repetitive. Like now that I think about it, why are they even max suits in the game? I completely forgot that they introduced this feature until a friend of mine reminded me a few weeks ago. It's not a bad game by any means now and you should probably still play the Fear Trilogy because it's one of the best FPS horror shooters of all time in my opinion. Just like some of these older games, it has some issues that you haven't noticed before. Ten years ago we also saw the release of Battlefield 1943. This was actually an Xbox Live Arcade and PlayStation Network download only game, which I think was the first one in the Battlefield series that did it like that. But this wasn't a full Battlefield game with story and a ton of multiplayer maps, this was multiplayer only with three maps, but it was really cheap so it worked out. Even though there's no story and there's only three multiplayer maps, I think this is my favorite World War II Battlefield game. And even to this day there's still people playing this game. The Xbox 360 also saw some decent exclusives. We had Halo 3 ODST released at the end of the year, and while it was really a standalone expansion for Halo 3, it produced a really interesting narrative that kind of followed the common day, everyday soldier that was the ODST. For once you weren't this super soldier who could just kill everything, and the story and atmosphere that went with ODST was really unique. Plus the multiplayer disc that came with Halo 3 ODST had the entire multiplayer of Halo 3 with all of the DLCs and that was kind of an ultimate edition of the game which was a nice touch on top of just ODST and the awesome firefight mode that was introduced too. Forza 3 also came out in 2009 and Forza was actually on a pretty good roll with each new entry in the series being pretty well received but Forza 3 brought a ton of new players into the Forza world and was definitely one of the more popular racing games at its time and is definitely one of the best best Forza games in the entire series even to date. And then on the indie side of things, Trials HD came out, and while this is a really common indie type franchise today, Trials HD was just this little motorcycle game back in the day that you could pick up for a couple of dollars, and it was really challenging but really fun at the same time, and I remember
remember just spending so much time in this game trying to get all of the expert level challenges complete and it was a lot of fun but it was definitely really hard too. But let's not forget that also in 2009 the Xbox 360 saw the release of Halo Wars, which was a real-time strategy game on a console. And it is extremely hard to produce a real-time strategy game that synergizes well with a controller. Like for example Tom Clancy's End War the year before it also came out on Xbox 360, but I didn't feel like it worked as well as Halo Wars did. They really made the RTS genre work here. And obviously this didn't bring like a new RTS craze to console and there haven't been really many RTS games released on Xbox box ever since but i gotta say this was just fun and after playing games like starcraft or comment and conqueror it was somewhat refreshing to see a game set in the halo universe a real-time strategy game set in the halo universe of course on the playstation side of things we had the release of uncharted 2 which really kind of showed off that the uncharted series could be more than just a standalone game and they could kind of hit gold twice sure there were some things that were different with this game but as a whole it was really well received and it kind of made this game a solid first party experience for Sony and kind of at this time Sony didn't have as many first party exclusive games available yet and Uncharted 2 definitely helped out a ton. And talking about games that made people want to buy a PlayStation 3, in 2009 Demon's Souls released, which was the start of From Software's popular Soul series and it's still going strong today. Just a few weeks ago I purchased Sekiro Shadows Die Twice and it's also really fun. I don't think there has been a single bad game in the series and some would argue that Demon's Souls is the best one even. It just had a perfect mix of being really hard and really challenging but not feeling unfair at the same time. It felt like you were hindered by your own skill, not by the game itself. And now with 5 or 6 games into this series they're still able to reproduce the same formula which you first saw in Demon's Souls 10 years ago. Over on Nintendo's side of things we saw Super Mario Bros Wii which kind of played off of the success of new Super Mario Bros on the DS and it brought the new Super Mario Bros in a new game onto the Wii which allowed people to play together, which was really cool, and just this game was a lot of fun to play. And we saw remakes of Pokemon Silver and Gold on the Nintendo DS in Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver, and these are possibly some of the best Pokemon games to date, even now, just because it took all the great things of those games from way back in the day and really just made the graphics great and just kind of took out a lot of the repetitive stuff that Fire Red and Leaf Green did when trying to make workarounds for putting an old game in a newer generation. It's kind of hard to explain, but Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver really did a lot of things right. And before we get to our last segment, here's my favorite part, which is Luke talks about PC games because Elijah is a dirty console peasant and Luke's only achievement in life is being PC Master Race. Anyways, in 2009, two huge games came out that I played for a long time, up until like this year actually. But before we talk about these two games, let's talk about The Sims 3, which also came out in 2009. I don't have too much to say about this game other than I really enjoyed The Sims 2 and I thought Sims 3 was a pretty decent upgrade. And there was five years between Sims 2 and Sims 3, so even with The Sims receiving a lot of content, I felt like it was the right time to get the next Sims out there. And still, to this day, I would rather play The Sims 3 over The Sims 4 actually. So let's get to the first one of the game that I talked about just a few seconds ago, which is Minecraft. We just like last week did a years later review on this game. So if you want to hear more of our in-depth thoughts, you can check out that video. There is a part where I talk about the PC release from 2009 till like end of beta. And then there's a part where Elijah talks about the Xbox 360 version in depth too. But yeah, in 2009, the original Minecraft Alpha came out and it was so fascinating. It was just a game that I haven't played before and it was just so confusing, but so awesome at the same time. Just like the classic Minecraft experience where you get thrown into the game and you don't know what the fuck is going on so you just build a dirt hut and you try to survive the first night and then you slowly figure out how to make a workbench, how to make some tools, how to mine and all that stuff. And I feel like that's the base experience but there's so much more to Minecraft. There's so many multiplayer things that I've played over the years that kept me interested. Then Creative came out after a while which enabled you to just let your fantasy run wild without farming too much. And honestly I keep coming back to this game every year. I just don't play it as much anymore as I did from like 2009 to like 2014-15. And the other game that I keep revisiting like every year is League of Legends. 
which also came out in 2009. And for the longest time, this game was so popular. This game was the biggest thing on Twitch, it was the biggest thing in esports, and there was just so many people playing this game. While this is a MOBA and so it's not for everyone and I feel like a lot of people can't get into it, and just looking at the genre, I was always surprised by the height of popularity this game actually reached. And I mean, once you get into the game, it's not hard to explain why this game is so popular and so much fun. There's a ton of different characters you can play, a ton of different game modes, a ton of different item builds you can try out, there's different lanes, different styles you can play. There's just so much variety this game offers that not a lot of other games offer. And it is probably one of the reasons why it's still one of the top competitive games in 2019. While I don't play this game religiously anymore like I used to in my teenage years, I find myself wanting to revisit this game at least every now and then. And see all the new champions that came out, the meta changes, the new game modes they have, and everything around that. And now, it's time to take a look at the Hall of Shame, because while 2009 had some awesome stuff, there was a lot of trash in 2009 as well. We also can't forget that we had DJ Hero release, which was just trying to live off of the hype of the Guitar Hero franchise, except you gotta be a DJ, so that's cool. And we had Call of Duty Modern Warfare mobilized, because who didn't need a mobile version of Call of Duty Modern Warfare that was just trash as a whole? Oh, and of course, we can't forget the best game of all time, Tony Hawk Ride, where it took all the fun of Tony Hawk out of the game and replaced it with a skateboard controller that didn't work well. But, um, you know, gimmicks sold. So they made a sequel later, but this game was pretty bad. But all that was nothing compared to what EA did. Remember just a few minutes ago when we said that Sims 3 was really good? Well, they also released three more Sims games in 2009. First off, we had My Sims Racing, which was just a Mario Kart clone. I guess it was their attempt to cash in on Mario Kart's success on the Wii. But where Mario Kart worked really well and the gameplay was refined, the maps were fun and there was a ton of characters, My Sims Racing felt like a PlayStation 1 game back from 1999. Then they also released My Sims Agents, which doesn't belong in the Hall of Shame. I just wanted to mention it because it also released in 2009 and it was a spin-off that they released with the other two spin-offs. But now we get to the worst Sims spin-off possibly in Sims history, Sim Animals. Let me, let me just describe this game real quick. It looked like garbage, it played like garbage, and the content was garbage. Not even 2009 IGN was able to give this game more than a 5 out of 10. This game came out on the Nintendo DS and the Wii and I thought this game might actually be fun because I played Sport a year before and this was supposed to be a life simulation video game too, but the end product was just complete garbage. And that's actually it for today's video. Let us know in the comments down below if we forgot to mention any 2009 video games and what was your favorite video game from 2009. Make sure to subscribe to Rockets Love if you haven't already and turn on notifications and check out the videos on your screen right now, because if you have watched this video this far, you'll also enjoy these. But that's it for today. See you guys next time with a brand new video.